you can reduce infection spread in the schools so much that most of the infections coming in from outside of the school produce zero additional transmissions in the school, which is in essence the best you could possibly do as a school. I'm J.B. Wogan from Mathematica, and welcome back to On the Evidence, a show that examines what we know about today's most urgent challenges and how we can make progress in addressing them. In mid-September, researchers from Mathematica partnered with the Pennsylvania Department of Education to run 400,000 simulations intended to inform school operating strategies during the COVID-19 pandemic. The simulations predict the level of spread of COVID-19 infection in schools, taking into account a range of factors, such as what the community infection rate is, whether the school requires masks and other precautions, whether it opens full-time or only part-time, and how the school would respond to a detected infection in the school. To discuss the results of these simulations, we have two guests, Adam Schott and Brian Gill. Adam is the Special Assistant to the Secretary at the Pennsylvania Department of Education, and Brian is one of Mathematica's researchers who co-authored the report discussing findings from the simulations. We'll talk about some of the report's overarching takeaways, as well as its practical uses for local school leaders. But just to give a preview, perhaps the most important takeaway is that precautions like wearing masks can substantially reduce infection spread in the school. And if the school also uses a hybrid operating model where students attend in person on a part-time basis, say two days a week in small groups, that can further reduce the spread of infection in the school. By the way, notice that I'm emphasizing in the school because school leaders cannot control what happens outside of the school in the broader community where infections may still occur. I'll let Adam and Brian explain the findings in greater detail. But first, let's hear from Adam. Every state is grappling with difficult decisions around if and when to reopen schools in person, and local leaders everywhere are hungry for guidance on how to do it as safely as possible. But not every state is commissioning agent-based computational modeling to shed light on the range of risks of reopening under different scenarios. So what led Pennsylvania to commission this analysis? So I think the backdrop to this is that the leadership of the agency has tremendous regard for our field, for the superintendents, for the chief charter school administrators, for the intermediate unit executive directors in a local control state with hundreds of school entities. Our work really depends upon the support of the field and the field seeing our direction and guidance as credible. And over the course of the first few months of the pandemic, we were hearing from these school leaders that, you know, I'm, I'm trained as an education expert. I can lead systems. I understand instruction, but I'm not a public health expert. And you're asking me to make the most significant decisions of my professional career. This is what was presented to us. And we need more evidence to go on, especially given uh, the differential impacts of, of the pandemic we had early and significant involvement in some of our metro areas. We have, at the same time, uh, one of the largest numbers of rural and remote school districts of any part of the northeastern United States, where caseloads are are in the single digits. And so the commissioned research was an attempt by the department when we couldn't provide all the certainty we wanted, uh, we couldn't provide all the financial resources that we wanted we at least wanted to put evidence out front that took advantage of the best possible methodologies as well as our state-specific data to show how different types of reopening would likely impact the contours of the next academic year. The Mathematica report is jam-packed with information because it's trying to predict infection spread under a wide range of scenarios. I asked Brian from Mathematica to zero in on some of the most important takeaways. So the first is that Precautions can substantially reduce infection spread in the school. All of our comparisons start out with a sort of hypothetical school that tries to operate as if there's no pandemic, tries to do that. We're just going to do business as usual, 
content without precautions. And then the idea is to see how much you can reduce infections with various different interventions and approaches. And just going from business as usual to a school that's still bringing every, all the kids in five days a week, but with precautions, notably reducing mixing of students outside of class. So things like you don't have the kids go to a big cafeteria and mix all together at lunchtime. They have lunch in their classrooms with the same kids they were in class with. And if there's recess, the recess also happens only with the same kids that are in the class rather than mixing across a whole grade or a whole school. And wearing masks. Those two things, if you can implement them, are likely to substantially lower cumulative infection rates. Then the second key finding is that a part-time hybrid approach dramatically reduces infection spread in the school further. And it's likely to do it well enough that schools operating with the same precautions I just described, but also doing it part-time, say two days a week in person, in small groups where, you know, that maybe you've divided the school in half, where half of them come Monday and Tuesday and the other half come Thursday and Friday. You can reduce infection spread in the school so much that most of the infections coming in from outside of the school produce zero additional transmissions in the school, which is in essence the best you could possibly do as a school. So when we're modeling, we're trying to estimate total infections among the school community, students and staff together, including not just the ones that occur in the school, but that occur outside in the community. And of course, there's nothing the school can do to prevent infections happening among school staff and students if they occur outside the school, right? You know, it's impossible to eliminate infections in the school entirely as long as people live out in the world. But the precautions plus the part-time hybrid approach make the school environment itself safe enough that very few infections among members of the school community will actually lead to additional transmission in the school. So those were some of the findings that Brian wanted to highlight. But I also wondered, from Adam's perspective at the state, what did the study add to the ongoing conversation around reopening? Were there any findings that were particularly important for his department's role in supporting local schools and school districts? We've had a good reception. I think that the field understands that we were the first state to commission this type of research. It adds to the evidence base that's been accrued by our State Department of Health and other experts. Again, it's an effort to use Pennsylvania-specific data and important school-specific information. So school type, size, again, local underlying infection rates, to use some of those those elements to allow every school leader to sort of see their circumstances in the research and to follow the implications from there. So we've had a good reaction, especially related to the hybrid or blended models. That's obviously from a logistics standpoint planning, what that means for parents and caregivers on the days that their child is not in school. That's an extraordinarily challenging case to make to a community that the reopening is going to be in a hybrid or blended model. I think the research has been very helpful uh, in helping school leaders make and defend those very difficult choices because we have hard data and the best available evidence that suggests that for all of the challenges that come with a blended or hybrid model, It provides the best path to maintaining a low infection rate, making schools safer than the community at large, and again, ensuring that on the days that the building is open for in-person instruction, students and families have a a greater expectation of, of consistency throughout the year. One of the report's more surprising findings may comfort those who worry that delays in the results of COVID-19 tests could make it even less safe for students to attend school in person. According to the modeling, if schools operate on a part-time hybrid model and require precautions like masks, then even if there are testing delays, school leaders can expect the delays not to have a measurable effect on infections because infections occurring in the school would already be low. 
I should note that that assumes the community at large does not have a high infection rate at that moment. Frankly, I, that's one of the things that surprised me. I thought the testing timeline would matter a lot more, but in the hybrid approaches with precautions, the transmission rates are sufficiently low that it doesn't, it really doesn't matter very much. One factor that I didn't see spelled out in the report was how infections might vary if the school is in an urban area or a rural area. I asked Brian about whether the model accounts for rural versus urban differences or geographic density. Denser places are more likely to spread diseases faster. But we, we, we think it's, a, it's better to, to deal with that by just directly accounting for the local community's infection rate because rural versus urban is just a much cruder way than saying, okay, well, what is the infection rate where you happen to be? And so that's why we've got the opportunity to, to have schools look at anything from 10 per 100,000 to 100 per 100,000 cases per week. And regardless of whether you're urban or rural, most places are going to be somewhere in there. If they're higher than that, Pennsylvania at least would tell them they shouldn't be opening their school buildings at all. Given that Mathematica completed this work for the state of Pennsylvania, I asked Brian if the analysis would be relevant to education leaders in other states too. I mean, first of all, most of the data we use is not Pennsylvania specific. We did sort of pick school sizes and class sizes and bus ridership, those sort of things based on what we know about Pennsylvania schools. But that kind of thing doesn't differ that much across states. And the thing that varies the most at the moment is the local community infection rate. And I think one of the things that makes this report relevant across the country is because we are showing results for a wide variation in, in infection rates. So, you know, I, I think these are likely to be just as relevant to schools all over the country. Mathematica's report in September updated and extended their analysis from a memo they published in late June for the Pennsylvania Department of Education. I asked Brian to explain how he and his co-authors refined the simulations they ran earlier in the summer based on emerging evidence on COVID-19. I think the major new evidence on the transmission of the disease that's emerged since we did our first report is better information about the relative susceptibility of kids and kids, particularly younger kids. So at the time we did our previous report, there was some indication that kids are less susceptible than adults, and we incorporated a general adjustment for that in our simulations in originally. Since then, newer, sort of larger scale, a study came out of South Korea found that basically the, the lower susceptibility is substantially lower for kids under the age of 10 and probably not lower at all for kids older than 10. They're more like adults in terms of susceptibility. So we modified our, uh, our assumptions to make them consistent with that. And what ends up happening is that you find that infection spread is much lower in elementary schools than in secondary schools. That's the main thing with respect to emerging evidence. Another thing that we changed in our assumptions, that we changed not so much based on emerging evidence, but I think on an emerging consensus about how schools should respond, has to do with wearing masks. Back in May and June, a lot of people were saying, well, we don't really think it's a good idea for kids to wear masks. We're not sure we can really ask them to. And so in the models, we assumed that kids would wear masks only on the bus, but not in class, and that school staff would wear masks only in staff meetings. Over the last couple of months, there's been increasing emphasis on the value of wearing masks, and so we decided we should build in the assumption that kids and adults would wear masks pretty consistently over the course of the day. Since Brian and his colleagues released findings from the initial set of simulations in the summer, they've had the benefit of observing how schools are trying to operate during the pandemic, including how they responded to detected infections. I asked Brian how the modeling is different now that they can see some of the strategies playing out. So we, we tried to extend the work in several ways. So in the original study, we were only looking at 
how long does it take before there are five infections in a school? Pennsylvania asked us to say, okay, let's not only look at the effects of different opening strategies on how long it takes to get to five infections, but let's try to look over the course of the school year, so for a longer period of time, what happens with these different operating scenarios and also modeling strategies for responding to detected infections. So we looked at three different ways that schools might respond based on, and we, we came up with these options based on consultations with Pennsylvania's Department of Health as well as their Department of Education. And the minimal response was assumed to be that when a case is detected, you quarantine that person and all of their close contacts. And we, for purposes of the modeling, we assume the close contact is anybody who is in a class or on a bus with the infected person. And all those people would quarantine for two weeks. Then the other two approaches involved sort of more aggressive responses. All three approaches involve the quarantining of close contacts. But in addition, the second approach says that you shut down the school entirely for three days to do an intense cleaning. And the third one, the most aggressive one, is you shut down the school building entirely for two weeks to try to cut off all new transmissions in the school. Now that the analysis is complete, I asked Adam what role the state would play in supporting reopening decisions and how the study's findings might help in that process. So we're a local control state. We are providing recommendations to school entities, which range from the school district of Philadelphia to, again, significant numbers of school entities that educate a few hundred students. You know, we're providing the best guidance we can, recognizing the diversity of the education landscape. And so that means a lot of getting on the phone, a lot of working shoulder to shoulder with a school district superintendent, very close partnership with the State Department of Health. We provide updated data once a week that looks at county level infection rates. And those county level infection rates are aligned to instructional model guidance. So the more involvement you see of COVID in a particular county, the more we strongly encourage school districts and other local education agencies to provide either hybrid or fully virtual education, depending upon the infection rate. So there are three bands, counties with substantial infection rates, counties with moderate infection rates, and counties with low infection rates. And the instructional model guidance relates to those levels, again, updated once a week. And what's been really helpful is that in important ways, Mathematica's research validates those guidelines by finding that blended or hybrid approaches are really the best bet for school reopening and ensuring predictability over the course of the school year. Thanks again to our guests, Adam Schott and Brian Gill. In the show notes, I'll include links to the full report as well as a news page that summarizes the major takeaways. We also have a blog post that should help school leaders interpret 12 pages of colorful bar charts in Appendix B of the report, which show how infection spread in schools would compare under 108 different scenarios, broken down by community infection rate, school type, and some of the operating and closure strategies we discussed in the episode. As always, thank you for listening to On the Evidence, the Mathematica podcast. If you found this information useful, please consider subscribing for future episodes. We're on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and elsewhere. Ratings and reviews on iTunes are also welcome. Finally, if you want to stay up to date on the latest work from Mathematica, follow us on Twitter. I'm at JB Wogan. Mathematica is at Mathematica Now.